Uh, well, I've been introduced. My name's Eba Pasha. I'm one of the technical officers from the Global Health Cluster, and I've been leading on this uh, alongside Boris, uh, as alongside all of you, um, to help uh, define and finalise this framework. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm just seeing all the people who are joining. I'm hearing a bit of an echo. People can be on mute. That would be great. Um, yeah. I'm just going through the list of people who are joining today and I'm really, really grateful. Thank you. I recognise many of the names. Some of them are cluster coordinators from the field. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A lot of them are health partners, but there's a lot of names I do not know, which is exactly how it should be. So I'm very grateful uh, that we've had this opportunity. It's been a wonderful collaboration with the Global Protection Cluster, with all their AORs from GBV, Child Protection and Mine Action, but also with the IWAG Interagency Working Group on Reproductive Health in Crisis, uh, which also now helped lead the um, GHC SRH task team. Um, as well as a collaboration with WHO attacks on healthcare and key NGOs who work in protection and health like IRC. So many thanks uh, for all the people who have been involved in this and the key agencies. And of course, many thanks to you guys who have joined this operational framework. What is it? Well, it's just very simple. Something that you always tell us to do and we all know we need to do better is really work out. Um, how we can improve our work, our core functions, um, our principal humanitarian response, as well as coordination um, around health and protection. We're all there trying to save lives. That's the structure that we all work under. Um, and it's just to help define some of those aspects, um, as well as our core responsibilities around this. Um, so I'm just going to, well, no, maybe not go to the next slide yet. The actual aim of the framework was to make it easier, mainly for those who are tasked with coordinating, but also uh, with all our partners who are involved in health response. So as you can see, we're a wide bunch of uh, stakeholders um, and uh, really trying to get this together made us go through a huge thought process that actually started back in 2019 with all the key groups that I've talked about, as well as doing country visits to understand what the needs and gaps are developing this framework and then field testing it in three <clears throat> locations in Colombia, OPT. And uh, one more, which my brain is failing me. Oh, Boris, please do go off chatting. So Sudan. So Sudan, of course. Oh my gosh, I would be in trouble. Um, so many thanks for everyone's inputs at that level. Um, obviously, we have many ways of working together. Uh, whether it's through integrated programming, joint programming, or even just information sharing. It depends on context, nationally, subnationally, what those dynamics are. But we all know that uh, we have key intersections and key ways of supporting each other throughout this. So let's just get to the nitty gritty, if that's OK. Uh, next slide, please. Why is it important? What are we doing? I kind of knew had some idea of what protection was back in 2019 when this all started and I think protection colleagues also had some idea of what we did but I think we've had some key um, seminal moments where our understanding of uh, what health and protection means has happened definitely evolved since the COVID-19 um, pandemic seeing how you know health uh, risks or health threats can really impact protection of uh, of affected populations, whether it's uh, been, you know, uh, worsening mental health status or whether it's been the increase in GBV or IPV or uh, violence against children. Uh, we see that we're all interrelated. Any threat, any risk, any crisis can increase both the harm and injury and the protection of uh, the populations that we're trying to support. So what is protection? This is my understanding. And this is what how we've articulated and came to you know um, understand more within the framework, and it's it's nothing new. I'm sure you all know this, and protection actors amongst you will be saying, "I know this," uh, whereas the health actors may be like, "Oh, okay," um, or not. 
Uh, but really, I mean, pr protection really uh, aims to fill, make sure we're respecting and fulfilling uh, the population or an individual's right for human rights. And that includes the right to health. And I think um, that is quite clear. It's very clearly articulated in uh, the protection policy that the ISC have written. It's very clear in the role uh, of GPC and how they're helping to mainstream uh, uh, protection across all sectors. Uh, but it's really in essence, as it's written here, uh, all activities aimed at uh, obtaining full respect for the rights of the individual in accordance with international law. So, you know, refugee law, humanitarian law, humanitarian rights law, human rights law. Um, and that has been clearly um, identified, uh, clearly, clearly articulated around the commitments we have around centrality of protection, making sure we're including that in all our um, all our actions as well as accountability to affected populations. What is the most important is that we all have a role to play. It's not just protection actors. It's not just the humanitarian coordinator. It's uh, coordination bodies like the cluster, but also partners as well. So what is health then? If we're all trying to you know, make sure we're achieving human rights, what is health? Well, you know, as defined in uh, under the WHO constitution, um, which is a member state organization. So basically all ministries of health have signed up to this definition. This is not equivocal. It is not um, it is not uh, con uh, controversial is very much agreed upon. It's a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. I know you can read, but I'm reading it out to you. But really, it doesn't mean that you just have a cough and a fever and that is what illness is. It means mental health. It means well-being, uh, well-being that helps you thrive. Um, this is defined in international human rights law under the ISCHR, which is everyone has the right to health, essentially. But what I think is most critical for everyone in this to understand, and what has been the precipice and the fundamental point of this um, <coughs> operational framework, is that actually health, to improve health outcomes, meaning to have healthy people who are not ill or sick or who live longer, actually social determinants pay play a huge part. We call it social determinants. Um, outside of humanitarian crisis, we know that this uh, equates to about 30 to 50 percent of the factors that make you healthy. Uh, that's things like food insecurity, violence, poverty, overcrowding, marginalization or exclusion will uh, decrease uh, your health outcomes, meaning that health actors cannot be the only ones to make a healthy population, to make them live longer and to live better. We're actually really, really dependent on the whole of sector, whole of society. Um, and just to say, this is enshrined in universal health coverage. That's an SDG around the concepts around leaving no one behind, but really that uh, everyone has the right to healthcare, no matter their vulnerability, their risks. And we have that defined in many uh, position papers within GHC or within WHO, especially around quality of care. These are even outside of the humanitarian setting, but we see that uh, centrality protection and AAP is already integrated within that. So we just have to, our job now is to make sure we all understand that and we can complement each other. Um, so, let me just move on to the next slide. I think we um, we would now like to hand over. Um, no, let me talk about this. This is the link to the document in case you haven't seen it. Uh, it's, uh, as I've said, the framework, uh, the intentions, what it's around, but it's really based around the core functions of a cluster. And so I think individually as clusters, we know what that is. I think in partners also know what our core functions are. It's your job to hold us accountable to make sure we fulfill our core functions. But given the multitude of um, actors, the um, GPC, the AORs, uh, SRH working groups, giving the multitude, the MHPSS reference group as well, apologies, I did not include them before. Apologies to the reference group. But given the multitude of actors that are involved, we thought it was very critical to define those accountabilities and responsibilities in the most basic form, in the tools that we already have, but really nuancing it to say, OK, if we are going to work jointly together, if we're either going to do integrated programming or even just share information, what does that look like? What are those minimum things that we should be doing? Lots of 
contexts and settings are doing this. And so there's a lot of good practice within that. And I'm glad to see that we have the Northwest Syrian um, OPT, as well as Columbia online. And many of you can also highlight within the discussion of where you're seeing it has been going well so that we can learn from it. And of course, the challenges. Uh, but this framework is really, it's quite a short document, but we hope that it really helps define uh, what we should be uh, doing uh, within our responsibilities. So that's why it's set around those core functions to remind us of what we're meant to be doing. Um, so again, within this presentation today, we're just going to briefly be going through some of those core functions, seeing how it links to different sectors, to you, to your work. Um, and on that point, I will hand over to Boris, who will be walk working us, walking us through this. Over to you, Boris. Eva. Thank you so much, and if you hear me, uh, if you hear me well first, to start thanking to to Emma and Anna for sending uh, for sending the links into the chat as some of the participants they were uh, they were asking, and uh, and also to thank the many good friends and uh, and known people now that they are uh, today uh, attending the attending this session. I can see the name of Jorge Martinez that we were working together on health in uh, in Palestine in Gaza Strip many many years uh, many years ago. And then Jorge and Eva, uh, we were working together as well in uh, in the Syria crisis uh, a bit less years ago. But uh, we have many things in common. And why I'm saying that is like a in a natural way, uh, people that they are like minded, they, we come to the same conclusions. And this is somehow also the purpose of this young operational uh, framework. We are not uh, we are not uh, in, uh, making rocket science, inventing something new. We are just putting together what it was the claim and what it was the dynamics that in some countries they were happening. We were, we were just organizing them and giving sense. It's common sense. The operational framework, it has to be understood like a tool that you can take whatever is useful for your operation or for the work that you are doing, and then it gets applied. No, uh, But as Eva was mentioning at the beginning, uh, we wanted to keep it simple. Uh, simple and operational, something that it can be a kind of uh, handy, document that it can get developed and, and often as you will be, uh, you will be seeing across the session with uh, with example of the colleagues of Colombia this kind of collaboration and this kind of uh, joint work and integrated approaches the across sectors this is happening one of the things that I like the most uh, from all this process, Eva, that goes particularly to you, is that how non-protection actors, they are starting talking about protection, because it's very true that protection is not only for protection actors, goes beyond, and we really appreciate that it has been with health uh, and the health cluster uh, colleagues uh, with, uh, with the body, with the body, with the coordination uh, platform that we start to develop this. Our aim is to keep developing more operational frameworks with the other sectors, but uh, so glad that we have been carrying out this process. And, and as you know, the cluster system is full of uh, um, tools, approaches, etc. And we have uh, six core functions. So the job, the general operational framework, it uh, is organized across the six core functions. You will see that all of them, they are cross-cutting. One uh, is integrated with the other and vice versa. And at the same time, they are things that uh, they are absolutely common sense. These are the things that a cluster has to do in collaboration and in close coordination with the, uh, the wide range of partners, as well in our case with areas of responsibility, etc. No? So let's go very briefly and we can discuss at the end of the session any any uh, if you have any comment, question or something that you would like to discuss more in detail. But let's go slowly uh, across all the uh, all the six uh, core functions. And the first one is to support the service delivery. And, uh, how we have organized this presentation, just yes, with two key questions. The first one is what we want to do, and it's as simple as the clusters and AORs, uh, the coordination platforms, that which are supporting the fulfillment of the right to health uh, and uphold the protection principles, they promote the access to health and protection services. It's to ensure that whatever we do is better for the population affected by conflict and natural disasters. And how we are going to do it? You will see if you are working on the operations, we are not telling you anything new, but we are standardizing the approach. We and also we have the commitment all across the actors, all across the working groups, the areas of responsibility to have that approach for making it happen, which is the, the success of the operational framework. Um, we are going to make multi-sectoral presence and response tracking. We are going to make as well multi-sectoral presence and response. Uh, this is uh, this is repeated. Apologies for that. And also to create information sharing uh, protocols. We will uh, define minimum service pa packets between health and the different areas of specialization of protection uh, to ensure that we have uh, in place effective uh, referral pathways and all these uh, to conform operational operating uh, standard operational uh, procedures SOPs. 
The only thing that we are saying here for to support the service delivery is that we need to acknowledge as protection actors and, to, and as uh, health actors that we need this integration. And uh, talking uh, one of the areas of responsibility that has been very active in the in the process of defining this operational framework, my action is to ensure that we have a referral that in case that there is one incident for uh, uh, for landmines or unexploited de devices, the the victim of that uh, of that situation has the effective and as soon as possible referral that goes from the physical health but to the mental etc and like this my action itself can cover the minimum standards of uh, services for people affected by uh, by uh, landmines and uh, unexploded devices as simple as that same for gender-based violence same for child protection same for protection it's a question of collaboration of ensuring that um we break the silos that can be uh, that, that can be a bit the, the key message of this core function and we start working together that in many cases we are doing it, but now we will be standardizing. So in my, if we can move to the next slide. Just to go uh, to have an overview about the core function number two, which is to inform the humanitarian uh, coordinator and the humanitarian country team on strategic decision making. This is a critical core function of the of the clusters and is the, the one that speaks about analysis and how this makes impact at the time of prioritizing and organizing the, the humanitarian response in the given country. And what we are going to do, we are not going to be a jump into defining core indicators or this kind of common tools, etc. that they are going to be very lengthy uh, and we don't know exactly which ones are going to be the, the, the results of those processes. However, what we have is a very well defined system from the health cluster. We have as well a very well defined on protection analysis from the from the protection cluster and areas of responsibility. What we do is to ensure the interaction, sitting together and working together and to have joint outcomes uh, through joint analysis sessions. And uh, it's just to ensure that the health risk are incorporated into the protection analysis and vice versa, that the protection analysis and the information from the areas of responsibility is properly integrated into the health analysis. That's it. Sometimes it's as simple as to put the people in the same table. When I was recently with uh, in, in Colombia, <coughs> organizing already this session with uh, the health and protection colleagues, apologies. Uh, it was a question of sitting down having lunch during the lunch break, uh, a working day, and just organize the different aspects for keep moving forward. And uh, this is how often the, the things, they, they move very smoothly. And how we are going to do it? You know that the protection uh, cluster has across operations, the protection analysis updates that they, are, uh, that they are replicated and updated on a regular basis. And the health cluster, we have the, uh, they have the public health situational analysis. So it's to sit together, to work together, and to ensure that the health actors and protection actors, they are collaborating and uh, participating in the joint analysis sessions for the production of this, uh, of this analytical product. And also to work together at the time of the humanitarian country team uh, strategy, at the time of uh, the annual humanitarian needs overview, to have this protection and health uh, risk uh, joint analysis. That will make an impact. It's, uh, it's the question of mainstreaming, and it's the question that it will move forward first there was a better response where we can um, when we can ensure the, the overarching approach of protection and at the same time to be more effective no, in terms of uh, quality and efficiency of our responses. Uh, these are also high level words and it has to go step by step, but it's just common sense. What what we are saying in the operational framework is what a good coordinator from health and a good coordinator from protection this will be doing on a regular basis and just to make it happen. It's, again, it's not uh, not rocket science at all. So yeah, yes, for not taking you more time, we will have a, a quick overview to the next uh, core function. And my view can thank you so much. And you will see that this is very much inter integrated with the number two and number second, and uh, number two and number one. You will see that all the six uh, core functions they uh, they are interconnected with each other, and is to plan and implement the cluster strategies. You know that we have the cluster strategy, all of them, and at the same time, the one from the humanitarian country team. And is uh, in this case is to focus that the humanitarian country team protection st strategy is reflecting properly all the analysis of health uh, to ensure the, the protection mainstreaming. And this is much connected with the work that we need to do in core function uh, number, uh, number two. Uh, here is divided in different core functions, but when we do it together, it's one, one step after the other. And how we are going to do it? Uh, again, is through the humanitarian needs overview, where the severity of the crisis and the most pressing humanitarian needs will be always including health and protection, and this cross-cutting and uh, joint analytical approaches. For the HRP, whenever it's feasible to work on joint and integrated planning or programming uh, for each of the clusters or even multi-sectoral strategies, 
and for the humanitarian country team protection strategy is to, to define the joint strategic indicators and key messages in order to to ensure something that uh, is so simple in a way, but too difficult to achieve often in the in the operations, which is the, the centrality of protection to ensure that uh, the scope of the humanitarian response has the, the centrality of protection is this. And for that, it looks again like it's very senior and high level management and discussions, but that starts in the frontline colleagues with the frontline colleagues working together and uh, knowing to identify how to make the prioritization of the different situations, how to exchange the information, how to have the referral pathways as we were discussing before, et cetera, et cetera, and to have a, a full integration and common approaches all across the, all across the response. Uh, there are six core functions, and we don't want to steal you much time going all across them, so we are going to have a very quick break uh, in terms of the defining the core functions, and we will have some more real experiences. Uh, and first, uh, inviting uh, another very good an old friend, Leonie Tax from the uh, International Rescue Committee. And Leonie and the uh, IRC, they have been absolutely engaged and involved in the production uh, of this joint operational uh, framework. Leonie and myself, we were working back again in Syria back in 10 years ago already, Leonie, but we are younger than before. And, <laughs> and uh, the floor is yours, and uh, please, uh, you can give the overview about the ERC's uh, role and, and um, interest regarding the job. Over to you. And Thank you. Super, thank you, Boris. Thank you, Dr. Eva. As Boris mentioned, I am Leonie Tux and I work for IRC, the International Rescue Committee. And uh, I work on a global level, but supporting teams with um, integrated health and protection aid initiatives within the organization. And as IRC, we've been supporting the development and now the rollout of the job, uh, most recently as part of the steering committee. And IRC has health and protection uh, programming in a large part of the current humanitarian crisis. And in many of them, um, we co-lead uh, the health or protection cluster or sector. And in the other crisis, we're an active uh, member of those uh, coordination structures. So we're pretty excited about this job um, for five main reasons. And I'll walk you through it. Uh, you see them as well on the on the slide. First reason is that it will lead to better outcomes for the population. As Boris mentioned, it's not rocket science, it's a common sense. When working jointly, um, protection and health actors can significantly improve service delivery and thereby health and protection outcomes for the population. To give one example, um, we recently did a joint study in Syria to look at access to sexual and reproductive health services for women and girls in the northwest of the country. And what we found is that, this is before the earthquake, um, services were often available, uh, for free even, but there were still prohibitive barriers to accessing these specialized health services, including uh, the lack of transport and the cost of transport, the lack of information, and the generalized violence um, bearing access to those services. So this is one example showing that um, the actual barriers to access are often requiring a joint health and protection program, an integrated health and protection program, to make sure that people can effectively access uh, the services that they need. And our country teams and frontline workers uh, consistently prioritize the need for such integrated approaches. But there are also some significant challenges in practice, and I'm certain that our colleagues in Colombia can speak to this as well. Um, very often, the technical organizations don't necessarily have the time and longer term resources uh, to prioritize such integrated programming. And sometimes the coordination between different organizations um, is deprioritized. And the job will help us reduce these challenges uh, and will help us actually implement more integrated longer term program. The second reason why we're supporting its development uh, is that it will make joint data collection uh, more likely and more feasible in practice. At IRC, um, data collection, analysis, and planning that cuts across the different sectors is really at the core of our programming. But we've also seen some of the challenges to those more joint approaches in practice. Very often, sector-specific data collection mechanisms do not necessarily meet the objectives of other sectors, um, and problems are measured in very different ways. And very often, um, health and protection experts do not share a common vocabulary around some of the issues that we see. Um, to give an example, when we talk about threats in the health domain, we mean something quite different from when protection experts use the word threat as part of the protection risk equation. So the job will really help us set some of the standards 
identify some of those common data collection mechanisms and basically make the process um, more likely and hopefully more enjoyable for those working on it. The GELF also promotes inclusion of local actors within data collection, as well as the engagement of local communities in the interpretation of data, the identification of problems and solutions. And this is a key priority for IRC country teams as well. And the processes provided within the GELF to do so would really support helping this out, uh, rolling this out at skip. The third main reason why we're supporting development and uh, the rollout is that it turns joint analysis into a standard practice. Um, the joint analysis mechanisms proposed within the job will help to bring frontline health and protection actors together, as Boris mentioned an example, sometimes physically together, uh, to create a cohesive understanding of the threats and priority needs. And a recent example of how this could work in practice is, for instance, when IRC support an initiative in northeastern Nigeria, bring together the health and protection um, sectors um, to look at the issue of violence against healthcare in that part of the country. And um, through a joint integrated data collection mechanism and a large um, inclusive joint analysis process, we looked at the data and we looked at, OK, how can we jointly move forward to find some solutions to this issue? So a very practical example of how this can, can work uh, for our frontline colleagues uh, and how the JAF can really support setting up those joint processes. The fourth main reason we're enthusiastic about this framework is that it builds on mechanisms that already exist. It doesn't create any new ones. Um, we know that there's limited bandwidth for our country colleagues to actually take on additional activities if there's no additional funding. So we're really happy to see that the job proposes mechanisms, you levering mechanisms that already exist, uh, for instance, as part of the HNO process, uh, and uh, strengthening them in terms of quality and inclusiveness to really make this integrated programming and integrated approach work. And then a uh, fifth reason and, and, and final reason is that it makes cross-sector coordination more predictable. And for us as a um, um, sector and cluster member, that's really an advantage because it means that um, we can actually plan much better our support to cross-sector coordination and really allocate our resources in line with what's needed um, to coordinate the response in such a matter. So to sum up, we're really enthusiastic about the development of this framework. We're happy to roll it out and looking forward to working together with all of you to roll it out in practice. Over to you, Boris. Thank you so much for setting such an enthusiasm and, and thank you so much also for showing that this is not only a cluster thing, it's something that any organization can start making use of it and for sure uh, to benefit all, uh, all across. So please, uh, you are welcome and this uh, job is for, uh, for everyone. But thank you across the process for your uh, dedication and professionalism. This is much appreciated. Um, we will give uh, the floor to a very interesting cluster because it's the only cluster that is 100% coordinated by national staff and um, by the way, is one of the most effective in terms of efficient coordination. Uh, they do the things with plenty of simplicity, which is something that we keep insisting uh, to all of you in the in the session. They are uh, having incredible challenges with several contexts and uh, dynamic situations that they change from one week to, uh, to another. But we can ensure that from both uh, health protection and the rest of the sectors and the clusters, uh, sorry, the, the rest of the clusters, they are incredibly dedicated people, some of them with more than 20 years of experience in the front line. And uh, I would like to, to give the welcome to our colleagues from the Colombia Health and Protection Cluster Coordination Team, uh, Dr. Laura. Gabriela, ¿cómo estáis? And uh, if you don't mind, I will, I will help with the translation between English and Spanish. ¿Cómo estás, Laura? Hola, Boris. Hola, muy buenos días para todos. ¿Cómo están? Bueno, eh, Gaby ya está ahí pendiente, pero vamos a iniciar. Sí, Gab Gabriela está conectada, but, uh, sí. we can start, podemos comenzar. Y si me haces las, para las frases cortas para ayudar a hacer la traducción, I was telling her, yes, to have uh, short sentences like this, I can help uh, it better in the translation. But, doctora, go ahead. More, well, more than welcome. Un gusto, Doris. Un gusto saludarlos. Bueno, eh, en primer lugar, eh, Colombia, por ser históricamente un país de multiafectación, eh, pues nos ha implicado repensarnos el trabajo de manera intersectorial, pero también reconocer la importancia que tiene el enfoque transversal de protección en todas las intervenciones. Esto, digamos, que nos ha hecho repensar desde los análisis y desde la respuesta y desde el monitoreo, 
cómo logramos respuestas más pertinentes a los desafíos del contexto. Gracias, Laura. Just, just trying to make a, a quick summary. Uh, As you know, Colombia has a multi-risk factors uh, that is combined with several profiles of internal conflict and natural disasters, etc. And that's the reason why the, the coordination teams they have defined it uh, from the beginning, from the uh, from the planning, the response, and the monitoring of this response. This multi-sectoral approach, uh, on La Dr. Laura's opinion, almost in a natural way, it came it came along with the dynamic of the response. Te paso la palabra, Laura. Gracias, Boris. Bueno, nosotros enumeramos cinco puntos. Sabemos que son más donde nos encontramos entre protección y salud, pero consideramos que han, cinco, han sido cinco experiencias como Colombia. El primero, hablamos de los análisis de, les, de necesidades y levantamiento de alertas por ejes trazadores en salud. ¿Qué ha implicado? Hace, recientemente, ustedes lo conocieron, la alerta de Buenaventura. Evidenciar, por ejemplo, la relación entre los eventos de interés en salud pública y los factores de riesgo asociados a los mismos. Entonces, por ejemplo, embarazos en menores de 14 años y su relación con presencia de actores armados en un territorio. Voy a parar ahí, Oris, y ya sigo. Ya, yeah, no, no, uh, gracias. Uh, Laura, Ana, Laura has defined five key uh, points where there is the interaction uh, between health and protection. We will go one by one. And the first one that she was uh, talking about is uh, through the alerts. The alerts is a system uh, that is well established in, in, in Colombia and is the, uh, it, it brings also as well the, the needs analysis. Uh, it was example of uh, the recent one in Buenaventura. Buenaventura is one, uh, one area in, a, in, a, in the department of Nariño, very much affected by the internal conflict at the moment. And they were making a joint analysis between the public health and the risks of protection. So they, they already identified the interaction between the early pregnancy of, uh, of uh, girls under 14 uh, years old with the presence of armed groups in the area. Dr. Laura, le paso la palabra. Gracias, Boris. Eh, lo segundo es también en doble vía. Entonces, por ejemplo, relacionado con los suicidios y los intentos de suicidio y el consumo de sustancias psicoactivas relacionado con dinámicas de confinamiento y desplazamiento. ¿Cómo se cruzan y se entrecruzan estos factores y otros determinantes sociales? Pero que val vale la pena y recientemente también publicamos otro documento que se llama Análisis de factores de riesgo y de protección relacionados con el suicidio. Entonces me mide por, a nivel individual, a nivel familiar, a nivel comunitario y a nivel institucional qué pasa frente a una, frente a una situación de salud específica. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Laura. This is really interesting. Uh, another point that they were uh, cross-cutting in terms of analysis, it was uh, the link between suicide and the consume of, uh, of drugs <clears throat> link with the uh, displacement and confinement. Confinement is when the communities in Colombia, they cannot get out of their area because of, because of the presence of armed groups. And they, uh, indeed, those armed groups often, they are controlling uh, the territory that is outside of the of the urban area, no? for saying it in a way. So the, the population didn't have a freedom of movement. <clears throat> And very recently, they were uh, they were publishing another document, which is the risk analysis uh, of protection uh, with with suicide. That it goes at institutional level, community level, and family level, and individual level, definitely about the the linkages uh, of the and the impact of the internal conflict to to the tendency or increase of uh, suicide. Uh, regretfully, lately in the in the last period, we are seeing in Colombia an increase, man, uh, particularly in the young age of uh, suicide population, not that they are affected in or they, or they are living in the in, in the affected areas. Over to you. Te paso la palabra, doctora Laura. Disculpa. Gracias. Bueno, y lo otro es como, por ejemplo, las ITS relacionadas con las dinámicas de conflicto, pero también con la falta de talento humano en el territorio por ataques a la misión médica. Entonces, no tenemos respuesta asociado por un abandono también del Estado, pero también porque los actores tienen un control territorial y eso de una u otra manera redunda en las cifras de ITS. O, por ejemplo, las amenazas eh, que suceden contra población específica por ser portadores de VIH 
o por tener COVID o asesinatos selectivos. Entonces, todos esos análisis se hacen de manera conjunta. Eh, si quieres, puedo parar y ya paso al segundo ah, punto. Yo, yo, de, this is a very interesting one, uh, doctora Laura. And, and it's about the, the link as well between the sexual transmitted diseases, and included COVID, you were mentioning, no? Incluso, incluso también de, del COVID, uh, but uh, in uh, sexual transmitted diseases, and the linkages with the conflict and the lack of access of the medical missions. Medical missions is the, the medical service, no? In isolated areas uh, uh, across Colombia. And also they were, uh, they were reporting about the, the link between uh, conflict and threats to the to the dignity and the security of the humans for, for being uh, for, for having a, a HIV or any other uh, transmitted disease, no? And included COVID. You were mentioning it as well about COVID, if I'm not wrong. Ahí está Gaby. Bienvenida, el segundo, Gabriela. El segundo es todo lo relacionado con el fortalecimiento de capacidades. Ha sido súper importante fortalecer las capacidades en enfoque transversal de protección y en acciones específicas, por ejemplo, de prevención de violencias basadas en género, entre otras, con el personal de salud. Entonces, esa es la segunda que lo reconocemos como una muy buena práctica, tanto a nivel nacional como a, la, a través de las mesas territoriales de salud. Thank you, doctora. Ana. Uh, uh, Dr. Laura is, uh, is highlighting you know, the, uh, how the capacity building and the increase of capacities to help actors from the protection uh, colleagues in terms of gender-based violence, etc., at national and subnational level. And this is something that uh, they really appreciate because it's really increasing the, the awareness, but as well, uh, it has an immediate impact in the, in the, the, res the responses that they do at field level. Uh, le paso la palabra. Gracias. El tercero es, por ejemplo, la identificación de riesgos. Sabemos que muchas veces el, tal, el personal de salud son los primeros respondientes o los únicos que tienen acceso a la zona. Reconocer y sensibilizar al talento humano para que pueda identificar otros riesgos, no solamente lo relacionado con salud, sino, por ejemplo, riesgos de reclutamiento, como ya nos ha pasado en el marco de las emergencias, donde los médicos identifican o una violencia sexual o un riesgo de reclutamiento, y ahí nos activamos de manera conjunta con el clúster de protección para dar respuesta y mitigar esos riesgos específicos. Fantástica. Thank you so much. Uh, another one is the, the, the again, the link. Uh, and the capacity, because health factors uh, often they are the first respondents arriving to a, a displacement situation. They are the ones that they can reach the affected population first. They have the capacities, the logistics, the infrastructure, and the strength. And uh, the training to these uh, health experts to identify uh, beyond uh, gender uh, gender based uh, violence cases, which is absolutely critical, but another risk that they cannot be immediately identified by health uh, practitioners as the risk of recruitment. So we have already identified cases where the, the doctors, the paramedics, uh, nurses, etc., the, the people that is attending the affected population, they have been trained and now they are able to identify uh, a child um, on risk of recruitment and then establish immediate action with the protection uh, cluster to, to attend uh, that specific individual case. Thank you so much. Bueno, y lo otro es cómo logramos responder en salud desde un enfoque de protección. Y esto que implica. Reconocer, por ejemplo, las sobrecargas yes, que de tareas de cuidado que tienen las uh, comunidades. No, but I can come. Para que tienen yeah, las comunidades. Adelante. Re <ríe> Reconocer, por ejemplo, las sobrecargas de tareas de cuidado que tienen muchas mujeres al acceder a servicios de salud que muchas veces van por los chiquitos, pero que no. Si no se tiene un enfoque diferencial y un enfoque de protección en la respuesta en salud, no pueden acceder a ellas y no pueden reconocerse un poco los riesgos que tienen en salud. Lo otro es cómo, por ejemplo, los niños y las niñas, cómo tenemos enfoque diferencial para la respuesta en salud mental, pero también en salud física, cómo tenemos ese enfoque interprogramático o ese enfoque interseccional para la respuesta. Y finalmente, digamos que vamos a abordar los últimos dos puntos, es el tema de gestión de casos. ¿Cómo reconocemos que la gestión de casos, por ejemplo, en salud, el protocolo que hemos construido desde el clúster tiene un enfoque de protección al reconocer que muchas veces salud puede ser una punta de todo lo que requiere? Entonces hemos encontrado 
casos de PDH, por ejemplo, en niños y niñas, que todos se activan por el caso del niño y la niña, y cuando identificamos es producto de una violencia sexual, de otras violencias en la familia, que si lo abordamos de manera adecuada podemos prevenirlas. Entonces, tener una, un protocolo de gestión de casos para el clúster con un enfoque de protección nos permite abordar otros factores de riesgo o disminuir, por ejemplo, la habitabilidad en calle. Um, doctora Laura, you got muted. ¿Te, te has quedado en mute, en mute ahora? Listo, perfecto. Sí, o reconocer, por ejemplo, el riesgo de las mujeres que tienen, o la mayoría son mujeres que tienen que trasladar chiquitos con enfermedades crónicas a otras ciudades sin recursos y eso termina o con una habitabilidad en calle o con explotación sexual y comercial. Entonces, tener esa mirada de un enfoque integral nos permite dar respuestas más pertinentes. Gracias, uh, doctora Laura. And, uh, she was giving us uh, several examples of uh, how they keep uh, mainstreaming protection all across the different, uh, all, all the different tools and approaches that the cluster is taking, uh, is taking into consideration. So it's like uh, to have Health strategy, I will try to summarize all the, the last points. Health uh, strategies with a protection on focus. So to have really the, the lenses of uh, what will happen with when a, a mother uh, needs to take their uh, their kids to the to the health facilities, they are going to be attended because for sure the mother will put them as priority, but then is not uh, taking herself into consideration. Also connected with the cases where uh, for specialized services, even if it's, uh, the access to, to health is, is granted, Uh, that woman, that, ma that mother, needs to move from one city to another uh, without uh, financial resources, and that puts immediately that uh, that uh, that person under risk. That it can end up on the street without having access to a to a shelter or potential risk of uh, sexual exploitation for co uh, trying to get some, some coping negative coping me mechanism for uh, for accessing to income. Um, the connection as well uh, between. Uh, On case man, uh, which is the overall uh, uh, rational of having the protection mainstream all across the, the case management, and that uh, also covers the, the children, that it goes to health, mental health, but also physical health. And she was highlighting, like for instance, some cases of uh, children that they, uh, they, they have uh, HIV, and that can have uh, many many implications about the reasons why uh, that child uh, got got uh, affected by the by the disease and it can go for, for any kind of level of abuse no etc cetera, etc cetera. so what what the health cluster is doing uh, and together with the protection cluster is to define all these tools and this capacity building in order to ensure that whenever as eva was mentioning uh protection is not only health but health definitely is also protection no the, this kind of uh, of summary that will be uh, that will be all from uh, from from my side laura no sé si quieres comentar alguna cosa más hay algo que quieras decir a gabriela te paso la te, te, te va aquí saludando estoy echando de menos a benjamín <laughs> Adelante, Gabriela. Hola, hello, hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I, I was just with my baby for, for us in Colombia. This is a really early time today, so it is. Um, sorry, for, apologies for that. No, it's just uh, you know, uh, how live is. Um, actually, I just wanted to say, uh, I think Laura covered um, our relationship, as you can see, health and protection clusters. We have this really close and smooth uh, relationship, and we have found that this uh, framework, this joint operational framework, will help us actually trying to be more operate operative. I don't know how, how to say that. Oh, more operational, probably, and effective in in the way we we articulate. Um, when we were just, you know, looking, seeing the document and just going through the different core functions and everything, we found out that we have been working together more than we thought. And we started analyzing that the whole, the whole relationship we had, we haven't actually magnified it. Like, we, we didn't actually identify it. We have been working together so closely for such a long time. Uh, that just starting to see these core functions and identifying them, it was amazing. So at the beginning of it, um, this uh, has been great for us and I think it will be, um, it will help us organize and operate uh, this good relationship that we already have and implement it, not only at a closer coordination level, but also in our organizations as well. So that's great and, and thank you very much for that. 
I just wanted to say that. Um, but thank you, Maurice, and thank you, Laura. Uh, Gabriela, Laura, thank you so much to, to both of you. Uh, Gabriela is the, our uh, Danish Refugee Council and Norwegian Refugee Council co-coordinator in, in Colombia. Benjamin is uh, his kid, which is one of the coolest in the country. He's always in good mood, impossible to get annoyed. I don't know how this guy uh, does it, but, <laughs> no, but very much uh, miss. And thank you. De nuevo, gracias a, la, a las dos. Gracias por estar aquí. And uh, apologies because it's very early. At the moment, it's like seven o'clock in the morning no? uh, back, in, uh, back in Colombia. But um, much appreciated. Uh, Laura, Gabriela, muchísimas gracias. Um, if you need to go for breakfast, go for breakfast. If you want to stay for the rest of the session, stay and we can keep discussing. Um, because we will have some round. Vamos a hacer una pequeña ronda de preguntas y respuestas con, con los colegas. But uh, moving back to English and for uh, keep moving with the session, I will give again the floor to, to Eva, which is going to, to help us to get through the, the rest of the core functions and finalize the presentation of what is the, the operational framework. Over to you, Eva. Great. So just before we uh, open the floor to uh, all the participants who have joined today, uh, I'll just briefly touch upon the last three core functions. Um, and thank you so much for the interventions from IRC and from Columbia. I think it really helps ground everything and uh, to see how, how it really relates to all the different types of actors. So one thing actually Leone said was around the indicators and monitoring what we're doing together or not. And so this really comes out in our core function four is how are we doing it and are we doing it well? Getting those indicators right can be tricky. Um, we have, you know, and not wrongly, but, you know, we have uh, lots of different groups. We work in different ways. We track different things. How can we say we've made an impact, for example, for women suffering violence, uh, GBV cases? Um, how do we know that we're doing well or not for to make sure they're you know able to uh, access all the services that they are entitled to and you know fulfill their respectable human rights? Um, what are those indicators have we jointly uh, talked about it? Do we have the same denominator even when we have uh, child protection? Uh, MHPSS services. What does that look like? How are we ex um, uh, assessing our impact with the with uh, linkages to other PSS or other mental health care services? You know, it just helps complete that whole picture. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just making sure we're jointly doing this. And many of our organisations across sectoral. So, you know, I'm sure you know, say the children IRC. There's lots of different organisations who work across health and protection. Probably have those same internal conversations themselves. So just uh, touching on that, that uh, the, uh, explains on that. The next slide, please, is around um, really capacity building. And this drives home with uh, localization, grand bargain commitments, but really to prepare um, our national counterparts, our national partners, uh, both for preparedness and contingency planning, um, but all parts of it, uh, you know, within the JOF, uh, we, we we gave examples, for example, um, Cox Bazaar, where there's great collaboration between GBV and SRH on ensuring that GBV survivors have access to the full gamut of services they're entitled to, also in DRC. I mean, we know uh, that probably may be our strongest um, of where we're doing much uh, more than any other sector, but the uh, is a very clear uh, a way of working that's uh, developed over the years uh, in, with much uh, kudos in respect to both the GBV AORs as well as uh, those working in uh, sexual reproduction health in crisis. Um, you know, they've really led the way on this. And I think there's a lot to learn also with regards to how they work uh, for our other sectors. But uh, um, you know, um, that is critical part of it. And definitely ensuring the localization aspect. Uh, once we're not there, the first responders, as Laura has just said, are the local partners, uh, are often health as well, but how do we make sure we're able to identify and uh, see what, what those priority um, uh, populations that need services. So that's uh, core function five. And then our last one, just to highlight, it's probably something that uh, we all know intrinsically, especially with the deterioration in uh, humanitarian needs in many contexts. Uh, Sudan this week, for example, uh, I know we're all dealing with it, partners uh, rushing on the ground, uh, running between meetings, uh, I am. Um, but, you know, we're, uh, violence, uh, conflict, uh, armed, uh, you know, armed conflict can uh, really affect any uh, access to service includes harm to the population, but you know, attacks on healthcare, 
is definitely enshrined as it is with schools um, in the MRM, but under international humanitarian law, a tax on healthcare is, uh, very, you know, is is very much uh, in contravention to that. It should be protected. These are basic uh, life-saving um, services that need to be done. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of advocacy happening from national all the way up to global, from actors all the way to the uh, secretary general on this. And we've been seeing those come out. But uh, ensuring that joint uh, advocacy is really key. And I think um, one great example is in OPT, where health and protection, we have a very difficult situation there sometimes when um, uh, it's impossible to uh, refer patients out from e.g. Gaza or even West Bank. Uh, there are joint communications between protection and health with regards to protection of civilians on this. These are basic life uh, saving services. Um, so there's a lot of good work already being done, but uh, we contribute to each other. Again, uh, health um, is not um, it's not just health, it contributes to protection outcomes and protection definitely affects health. Um, I'm not going to go into other examples because there are numerous, uh, but uh, it's just to say that building on that joint approach, building on the evidence, building on everything that the work is done that we feed into those global advocacy um, as well as national, as well as local um, uh, interventions that we're meant to be doing. So on that note, I'm going to not talk about four factions anymore and uh, uh, hand over, I think it's to Boris or to Emma to open it to the floor, I believe. Same, same. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Eva. Uh, yes, uh, Emma is going to help us with the questions and answers so colleagues, dear participants. If you have any comment, any question, something that you would like to share, to discuss or to ask uh, to any of the of the speakers in this session or to the rest of our participants as well, please now is the moment and we can just dedicate. Um, there is not a particular order, just feel welcome. Um, let, let's go for it. I, everyone's being very shy. So, um, Emma, so I raised my hand. Emma, uh, oh, Eva, great, yeah. sorry, great. <laughs> Safik, <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Safik, uh, health cluster coordinator uh, for the cross border operations in based in Gaziantep. So, uh, just I have a few uh, points. One important uh, point is related to the to the uh, to the advocacy uh, joint advocacy efforts. So, I think this is a very important area in our case in the po post earthquake situation. The medical referral from North Syria into Turkey is, is suspended, uh, was suspended for a few weeks after the earthquake because the hospitals in the border area, they were they were impacted and there were cracks and damages in the on the Turkish border side. Uh, so we, we started the joint advocacy efforts to 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 restart the, the medical referral from North Syria from Adlib in Aleppo. Uh, into Turkey to to facilitate the patients who need specialized healthcare services in in different hospitals. So one of the big hospital was the Hatay Hospital, which was damaged during the earthquake. And the so we were looking for alternate solution, alternate uh, facilities to accommodate the, the the medical referral from Syria, not with Syria into Turkey. So we started joint efforts in uh, with the protection, especially with the child protection AOR uh, to with the with the deputy regional humanitarian coordinator with Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to get approval. So we have succeeded in that effort. So this is this is just an, a practical example that how uh, joint efforts uh, and joint ad advocacy efforts uh, by both uh, protection and, and health cluster works in a, in a complex humanitarian crisis, especially in the uh, in the post uh, natural disaster situation. Uh, another important point uh, I would like to highlight is the core function four, which is the indicator for monitoring and evaluation. So I think one important uh, document, a tool is the GIAF, the Joint uh, Intersectoral Assessment Framework, which is a very important, I, I mean, uh, although it's not very successful so far, but it's a very important tool in terms of uh, joint collaboration uh, between clusters and sectors to to, to have, a, 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 I mean, more joint indicators for monitoring of the of the of the needs and severity of needs in in complex situation also of course in the post I mean in disaster uh, crisis situation uh, third important point is colleague mentioned from uh, from Colombia the the, the MHPSS which is one of the key uh, uh, health uh, area not only health but it's, of course is more cross sectoral but the clinical side is more under the health response 
So we have a uh, very good example, practical example, especially the two uh, issues my colleague from Colombia mentioned, the suicide attempts and the, the drug abuse, the substance abuse issue. So we are jointly tackling that though these two issues, uh, not only with protection, with, with other with other uh, with other education and other clusters also. So there are certain uh, areas, a specific areas, if we we can identify those joint uh, areas. I know you will be working more on those through the framework. It was not mentioned in the presentation, but in the framework, it will be more highlighted. But we need to work jointly at the country level also to identify some of those those practical areas, like I mentioned, the, the cross border uh, referral from one country to another. Uh, this is one example. So we can we can share more as cluster coordinators from from uh, field from country clusters. Thank you. Uh, you can thank respond you. or slide, Boris. <laughs> No, no, no. Thank you, Mudir Muhammad. Uh, so good to hear your voice. Uh, no, indeed. Yeah, yeah, just for me to, to give you a very quick uh, thank you so much for the great overview regarding all the activities that you are uh, carrying out. And good luck with the work ahead. And um, we know that there are hard times at the moment with you. So all, uh, all the support. But yes, it, I was uh, I was smiling when you mentioned the, the question of the GF. Uh, the GF 2.0 is about to come. And believe me, the, with the colleagues of health and, uh, and the protection, we have been working for the last two years to make it a bit better. It will never be perfect, but you know that questions of uh, access to health and uh, attacks to health facilities, whenever it's uh, pertinent to taking into consideration, is taken into the account for the overall uh, intersectoral analysis as well. No, but here I would like to highlight also the, the good collaboration with the global health colleagues in this process, and we are we can we are meeting on a weekly basis at least. So soon you will hear more from us. Oh, over to you, Eva. I guess that you have any additional comment. Um, I think you. Uh, I'm really proud of all the work that impressed, not proud. <laughs> um, uh, impressed by the work that you're doing with all the colleagues. Everyone's working so hard, and you know you're right. Absolutely, uh, medevac or referrals, especially between um, uh, over countries, is a very uh, tough one. And so, just just for everyone to be aware, there are, this is a tool that's seen as a, a groundwork, it's a framework, it's uh, defining our responsibilities. There are lots of tools or checklists or uh, specific themes uh, that need addressing uh, that hopefully will you know, help catalyze, will be able to burgeon um, if it's around medevacs, access, if it's around referrals, of whatever those may be. So um, uh, we want to address those gaps. It, um, this is around the accountability and responsibilities and basic um, basic uh, actions that can be done and then specific things uh, we'll be guided by you absolutely I mean I think you're absolutely right there are so many needs and gaps and I think this is just a great opportunity for us to now catalyze what those uh, technical things will look like you've already done as we've seen it may be that we just follow your protocol <laughs> and use that and see if it's applicable for others use it's good practice um, but there's just so much that you are already doing that we can learn from so thank you from that um, Boris, I just want to highlight there are two excellent questions uh, in the chat. Uh -huh. um, so if they want to to share it with us in uh, in plenary, please go ahead. Yeah, um, Camilla, um, I'm going to ask you because this is a great, uh, great. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, and thank you and so much. And it's got four this. likes. <laughs> That's nice. Um, yeah, just thank you very much for this discussion. It's really um, very helpful. I'm actually a colleague from the development side, more from Help Aid International, but I've been supporting um, colleagues with from the humanitarian side too. And a key thing that comes up quite a lot in our work is the overlap um, around care and support. So when I, it was great to see your introduction and the very um, broad understanding of health as um, you know, the, all the social side as well. And obviously with older people, you've got the full continuum of health and care related needs. So we're always talking about health and care. Um, but obviously there's quite a lot of overlap there when it comes to protection. Um, and so I was just wondering if that's an issue that you've addressed at all in, in your work or come across and yeah, how, how if there's any good examples that you could share or yeah, information. <laughs> Maybe not examples, just if that's an issue that you've, <laughs> you can you've come across back. and yeah, I'm interested in reflections. Thanks so much. If you if you want, Eva, I, I can uh, I can 
give a couple of inputs because uh, Camila, as you know, HelpH is also partner of the protection cluster, and we are working a lot on the um, integration you know, of aging and, uh, and disability. We work very closely with uh, Luciana and with uh, Rawang, that is part of our team, and things that uh, we can be doing. Uh, by the 30th of June, the question of integrating uh, elder people, older people in the in the overall analysis for the humanitarian needs overview, that will be one of the, the deliverables of the current project that you are uh, you are carrying out, for instance. There are the different modules for helping the, the identification of needs uh, of uh, older people all, ac all across. Um, I also consider that uh, uh, what is the framework at the moment? The joint operational framework is is a strategic, is a kind of uh, the, the big uh, the big overarching approach, and then this is implemented at uh, at, can, uh, at country level. So, but from our side and from the side, definitely from uh, from health. When we talk about analysis, that that can be the the area that I'm working the the most. Uh, the integration of uh, older people all across the risk and needs uh, this is a uh, therefore is there and we have improved i'm former help page myself from many years ago and we have improved from 10 years back to now well, over to you Eva, in case that uh, so you want to add something else yeah i, I mean uh, just to reiterate from the health side uh, of what boris has just said it's very for us um it's that i I mean, this is just basic AAP as well, but, you know, for quality healthcare and leaving no one behind, it's really understanding the different needs, the different barriers of all the different groups. Um, we were, we, we, I think we wrote it once within the JOF itself, because there's a long list of uh, vulnerable groups. It's just about vulnerable groups, it's about capacities as well, it's about external threats, so risks is how we're really um, thinking about it. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, COVID was very clear. Uh, yeah, older people. That was very specifically an older people health threat. Uh, and then uh, older people in humanitarian uh, situations are even more left behind. So it's um, it's quite horrible, really, if we look at, you know, vaccination coverage of older people in IDP camps. I think it's awful. It's just, it's awful. I actually was the focal point on that. Uh, still am. Um, however, there is a lot of good synergies going on. Uh, if we think about, uh, Shafiq was just on, I know they have a disabilities working group there, and that includes old people, and they do a lot of work uh, regarding the barriers for older people and healthcare. It's very interesting what you're saying about um, care, as in social care, I would presume, and that I think we probably could have a bit more to do with, but we do have um, to uh, do well upon. There's lots of things, for example, in the sphere guidance, which I was um, uh, part of as well, you know, is how multi-sectorally uh, older populations, it might be incontinence sheets, it might be, uh, you know, sheets, it might be food, it might be AIDS, uh, there's so many things and it, it really is a cross-sectoral thing. So however that goes forward, uh, you know, we're more than uh, happy to have that conversation and hopefully, you know, and that is very context dependent on how those uh, coordination groups at country level, but it's not a no, it's a yes. If it's, if you've identified it as a need, let's make this happen. Um, I, th um, I know we've got a comment from uh, Samarit Melis about Cox Bazaar, and I know they work very, very strongly across, and she's even written it in there, about age and disability. And actually, it was the protection action actors in Cox's Bazaar who, the community protection actors, uh, working group, um, community like, protection actors who helped sometimes literally carrying older people to the health facility to get their vaccinations. And we have pictures on this, we have loads of stories. I mean, it's an amazing success to all those on the ground. I know Francis is on the call right now, but there are great examples of collaboration. I mean, that was very health specific, but the wider needs of uh, older people, of course, um, is a multi-sectoral effort. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate those um, responses. And yeah, it, and as you're saying, it's a holistic approach, the person centred and then designing those integrated um, responses. So it's great to hear about um, so much of that work. And obviously, I'm quite familiar with with lots and colleagues putting stuff in the chat, too. So thank you. Great. Um, Boris, is a uh... Or the... There is one from the next one. If I if I'm not wrong, the next one is uh, from uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, from Beth uh, Flint. Uh, Beth, do you want to share it with us? Go ahead. How are you doing? Hello, hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, no, this is really fascinating. So thank you for the opportunity to join. I am um, I'm with the GPC at the moment, um, working on um, trying to find out from the clusters uh, whether trafficking is embedded. 
um, in protection responses. And so I'm obviously thinking about intersections with other clusters as well, um, even though the focus for this uh, study is, is protection clusters. And I just wondered whether through developing this framework and the work that you've been doing, whether you've identified any particular gaps in knowledge um, uh, around certain protection risks. And, and you, you mentioned uh, the example of, of the role of healthcare professionals as first responders, and um, that they may be coming across, you know, potentially the most vulnerable. Um, and I just wondered, yeah, whether you've identified any particular um, gaps in, in knowledge or capacity um, in, in certain protection risk areas. Is Boris going off you? I don't know. <laughs> uh, go, go, go ahead, go ahead if you want. Any so many, um, so many gaps. <laughs> I would just say that. Yeah. <laughs> so many. Um, I don't, but Boris, I'll let you come in afterwards just because I've already started. But in fact, at the global level, even at our level, there was a lot of, uh, it was a learning experience uh, the, for this uh, operational framework. Uh, it started in 2019. We had a country case that is. Uh, you know, really learning from the field. It was a learning process for ourselves to understand what pro protection risk is, what that means for health. Isn't a health risk um, something that incre in increases the likelihood of death or illness or uh, otherwise? Isn't that a protection risk? And it's like, well, yes, of course, if someone, um, you know, so it depends on the context and it depends what it is. So we're often not speaking the same language. We don't understand, as I think Boris said at the beginning. So yes, right from, uh, top to bottom, bottom to top. There's a lot of education that needs to be done on this. And uh, that's why we're so grateful. <laughs> we finally got to this point right now. There's a uh, good work that child protection is doing, for example, on working with health. And just the other, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, we're like, what's case management for you? I'm like, what's case management for you? And, you know, just the uh, identification of cases. And we're like, well, identification for health is something else. Uh, compared to child protection. So there's a lot of avenues. I'm not going to bring them up now because it won't be in any, it will be a stream of consciousness rather than um, any sort of prioritized uh, rationale behind it. But there is a lot. Um, and But there's a lot There's a lot that we're doing. And so again, it's about, uh, I think our next steps, We uh, we're, the vision is, is that we bring in all the wonderful things that countries are already doing, making sure we have that um, standardised, systematised, so that everyone across all contexts and all partners can uh, can utilise and leverage this. Over to you, Boris. Thank you, thank you so much, Eva. Yes, yeah, maybe to add a couple of words more. And uh, trying to use the example of a primary health uh, system and mental health. You know that the primary health system is the one that identifies the potential case for uh, for mental health services within the public uh, within the health system. And one of the key aspects that uh, it was important to work with it was to to ensure that the health practitioner at primary uh, primary health center can identify the case and can activate the referral mechanism to more specialized services whenever it was no so if that is applied to 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 protection it, we, we, as we have been repeating all across the session it's, it's a question of common sense no but sometimes it's the possibility what uh that the dr laura was mentioning about the referrals or the case management etc is not about uh training then about the whole scope of the question is just to train them or to tell them that this possibility exists and it can be activated. And when you see this trace or this proof, that can imply uh, many other uh, things more. But at, at the same time, vice versa, as uh, Dr. Eva was mentioning, is very much required to help the protection actors to understand which one is the, provider, the, the profile of health. Because sometimes we have misconceptions of way, ways of understanding how the health is working that is not exactly adapted to the reality. No, So it's, uh, it's in two ways, but uh, more than a capacity building in terms of training and on, on every single detail is just to tell them and to share. And I think that the EOF is like the first step for ensuring that we articulate this on a standardized or systematic way. No, it's more uh, speaking. Uh, always there is a there's a point for uh, for consensus. That will be all. Over to you. Thank you both. That's that's really really helpful. Great question, though. Um... Okay, oh, Ron's coming in. Um, uh, there is a question from Patrick uh, Culver or Patrick Culver. Patrick, do you want to share it with us? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, first, this has been a great session. I really have appreciated this. Uh, it's been fantastic. So thank you. 
Um, my question is really around the the idea of implementation of action in terms of coordination beyond just the coordinating pieces. And I think as emergency actors, we're all very used to getting around a table, having conversations, but that doesn't always translate when it comes to that next piece where there's implementation and action together. And so my question is really, what are the best practices that you've seen work in terms of, especially in the early days of an emergency response? How do you translate uh, good collaboration and coordination into direct action that affect outcomes? Yeah, <laughs> that's like the tiniest, most biggest and most essential question. <laughs> you touch the heart, the heart of coordination, Mr. Patrick. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, there is good practice, let's put it that way. Um, COVID-19, we saw a heck of a lot of good practice. We had uh, operational feasibility for any intervention was terrible. People couldn't move, people were locked down, we couldn't uh, relocate staff. Multiple um, uh, times um, we saw integrated and people just forced into integrated programming. It was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to GBV and SRH because uh, I seem to follow it. <laughs> But, you know, but even with mental health, um, you know, the other ones just piggybacking or jointly delivering services in some cases, you know, and even in Afghanistan right now, we have a female uh, uh, aid worker ban, but uh, healthcare work is exempt. So there's, you know, many organizations have naturally said, well, what can we include in our health team realistically, feasibly? Um, you know, can we include and uh, do more around child protection? Can we do more around GBV services, etc.? So I, there's already stuff going on. It's very, very difficult. I, it would be a shame to say we only do it when operational feasibility is terrible. Um, but, you know, in general, there's uh, there is the shift to for a humanitarian response to become more efficient. Um, whether it's through area-based coordination or otherwise to be more integrated. There are plans which have integrated, you know, multi-sectoral response within it. It's 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 the next step and how can we do that better? Maybe I'll talk to, uh, maybe there's some of the cluster coordinators on the call can explain better. But I don't, I don't want to blame the donors as well, but it, the whole the whole thing needs to be conducive, you know, for, for that joint programming. I mean, there's that, you know, I'll do it if you do it, oh, and the goodwill type of it, but then a uh, kind of a response where we accommodate and do it together. And that, of course, is kind of round the table, but institutionally, more systematically, we need that planning in place. We need uh, a better idea of, you know, well, how many how many community workers, multi-sectoral community workers do we need or not uh, to provide X, Y, Z services? And I'm just going to bring something up, which is really key, which is in uh, core function one, which we talked about. And it's actually a commitment from the Grand Bargain as well. World Humanitarian Summit, sorry, the World Humanitarian Summit is around standardised packages of, of services, the minimum services. If you know what you're meant to deliver and if you've contextualised it for across sectors, if I know from GBV, if I know from child protection, if I know from protection, what is meant to be done at the, uh, you know, what populations are entitled to within this context, then together you can say, oh, well, this is what I can do and this is what you can do. This is where this may be done with X number of community workers or not. Um, so we're trying to develop all those things for a more efficient uh, response, but for a more integrated uh, response that, uh, there is good practice, but there's still lots more we can do. But that's that's the next step. Indeed, Thanks. a step by step. And pa Patrick, your, your question is fantastic because I, as I was telling you, you touched the heart of coordination. Uh, I can give some light, uh, good experiences that they came to my mind with some uh, from some of the examples that we were having during the session. But uh, at the end, the success of any decision uh, uh, beyond communication, etc., is the commitment and the common effort from the from the decision makers, but at the same time from the coordination and particularly from the frontline workers, these uh, colleagues that we have from health and protection to keep that light on and to make it to the to the last consequences if it's needed. No, um, that depends when the people is uh, what, what we need to do. And, and I saw and I started to use the examples. Uh, I, I saw that Norita, one of our colleagues from Colombia, which she is a frontline in one of the subnational offices, she is participating in this call at the moment. Uh, we need to convince her uh, to convince her. And once she's convinced, and then the colleague from health that is in the same subnational uh, unit gets convinced, then the things, it will happen. 
And that's why I was uh, we were uh, we were insisting in a way that simple, adaptable. This can be done. This is not rocket science. We will have some operational constraints and challenges, but this is common sense, and it may happen. Uh, another example, uh, making a. Uh, abuse of uh, of Colombia is the what uh, Dr. Laura was mentioning about the analysis in Buenaventura. If you remember, it was this uh, Buenaventura is an oper operational office. They are operational practitioners. They needed to make a deeper analysis and they put everyone together, all the health factors, to make that product that is much inspired to the is, is similar to the protection analysis updates that we have now because they saw that this tool, this approach works. So they were they make it in the same. Uh, they, they started to produce it and that provokes the facilitation of the interaction when they have, uh, they get the approach to the to the protection actors. But always uh, going back to the to the bottom line. Uh, th we have a sentence in Spain, uh, an analogy that we say, we pray to God, but we work with our hands. No? So the key decision make makers is fine, but then we need these two hands to make it happen. When we have that, then anything is possible. No? Over to you, Hans. Our apologies if it got uh, too long. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands up, but uh, Marion Staunton, she does have. Oh, there's one. Oh, we have Annalisa. Please, Annalisa. <laughs> oh, OK, fine. Marion will come Hi. to you afterwards. But yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. So nice to meet you all. I'm uh, from the ITRC, from the International Committee of the Red Cross. And uh, actually, it's a, a very short comment. I wanted to congratulate you, of course, for, for the document and to say that for us, uh, it's, a, it's a big gain to have the, the job in place especially for the element of bringing a uh, highlight on the issue of attacks against healthcare. We know that uh, WHO has been working with this uh, for the past decade or so and trying to include that more and more in the work of the health clusters. And I'll see that being a, a joint effort from both clusters for us is something really, it's a momentum that really should be, be taken up to avoid having just that look as being protection of healthcare being something you know, a bit outside of the, the strong intervention of protection in this humanitarian context. Colombia specifically is a, is a country that does an amazing job of that. So I, I appreciate also to have them here uh, giving their, sharing their examples. But uh, yeah, just to say that we, we really appreciate the, the, the mention of this specific topic and the way that it was spread out throughout, throughout the whole of the job. So congratulations to you guys. You've read it. I can't believe it. I'm very impressed. It's only been out a week. Thank you so much. That's uh, that, that makes me feel warm inside. Um, Boris, I'll let you respond to that. But also, uh, just say, yeah. what else? But to say thank you, Annalisa. The, this comment is very much appreciated, particularly coming uh, from you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and yes, it's still work to do, but uh, we will keep working on that. Yeah. And if you need any time to see how we are working on integrating, as Mohammed was mentioning, in the in the joint intersectoral analysis, the tag to health facilities together with health, etc. Yes, reach us any time, and we can have a, a, a chat. No, about how we are trying to to keep including it and, in, and making it present, and not only to health facilities but also uh, school for educational facilities. No, but happy to. With, with pleasure, uh, I'd be happy yeah. to meet up. Yeah, thank yes. you so much. Get, get, get yeah. in touch with us. Well, we can just have uh, the emails here in the chat um, anytime. I just have to say, uh, Hyo Jung is uh, who's the lead on attacks on healthcare from WHO. She's on the line right now. I'm not sure if she's listening, um, Hyo Jung, because I know we're all multitasking with thousand emergencies right now. But uh, Hyo Jung, if there's any comment you wanted to say right now, number one, thank uh, you very much thank, for being with us. Thanks, Eva. Yes, I'm online, and thanks, Annalisa, for that comment. I think. Uh, I think it was actually a bit of a joint effort from everybody on the attack side. I, I know we work very closely on the attacks and healthcare. We've always talked about the need to include this, not just for the health side, but for the protection and bring the two together. So I think kudos to all of us <laughs> for, for, for trying to bring that together. And thank you to Boris and Eva for allowing us to integrate this as part of the job, because I think it's also, as, as Annalisa mentioned, it is a big step forward for us to really try to implement the what next there are attacks now. What, what can we do to really protect these healthcare uh, service delivery points from attacks? So I think it was a really great step forward. Thank you. Great. So if it's okay, there was uh, a comment uh, previously from Marion. Oh no, not Marion. 
Sorry, Marion. Or was it Marion? It was Marion. Marion, you've given so many comments. That's wonderful. Uh, around palliative care and home-based care and support. And uh, I'd love for you to talk about that because, again, in Sphere, we have a standard on palliative care that came out in 2018. But uh, it's a really important topic that we're definitely talking a lot about within health. So over to you. Well, thank you very much for a really very, very interesting session. And I'm very happy. I'm uh, Health Age's Global Advisor on Protection and Mental Health Psychosocial Support. I'm a psychologist uh, in a previous life, um, working in this sector for a very long time. And I love to see this integration of what you've talked about. You've spoken very well to my colleague Camilla's question in relation to, you know, care and support with older populations. Another colleague uh, within this uh, group asked about tools. Let's start with the basics and the basics I mentioned sad sex, age, disability, disaggregated data. That's what we have to keep hammering on about in relation to really understanding the needs, the risks and the capacities of those that we work with for us, particularly older people. Palliative care is coming more and more into the discussion. I know that in Sphere, there's a wee paragraph. Maybe it's longer. Right? So I haven't read standard. it. Standard. It's got a standard. Yeah. <laughs> And it's something that within HelpAge we are exploring and working on more. We have recently uh, onto our team a global health advisor, and he has a lot of experience in relation to palliative care. So I was just putting that out there for discussion and also home based care. And for us, what we're talking about in relation to that, and it's clearly linked with protection risks, are those most at risk isolated older people who are at home for various reasons, whether it be disabilities and other re reasons, cannot get out of the shelter where they are and the kind of support that they would need. And this clearly is the link with health and protection. So um, that's really all I had to say more than a question. It's just thrown out a few comments there. But But thank you, colleagues. I mean, it's wonderful because uh, I think even just talking with everyone in this funny little environment online, we're getting so many views and so many, so much more understanding of how health and protection inter interact. Let's put it all aside. It's if we all just had a people centered approach and just thought about me or my family, if it was us, then, you know, what would my mom have to face to be able to access health care if there's bombing? What is she going to do if she can't get there? Uh, what does it mean for my daughter to be able to go and get education or uh, get water or whatever it is? So if we just kept, you know, have a people centered approach, uh, you know, basics of AAP really, um, then it We'd be fine. <laughs> We'd yeah. all, go, all right, we need this. Uh, but we we have our um, operational expertise, which is also really important, you know, because we know how to respond in that. But we've got it. It's if you understand the needs first, that all should be much uh, better. And so, uh, really grateful for the job. I am going to put a little plug for palliative care, and uh, as you brought it up, um, I just have to say, in humanitarian emergencies. We call them humanitarian emergencies, number one, because, you know, the needs outstrip the ability to provide. But generally, there's a higher death rate and a higher illness rate. So we know that people are going to die more in our context than compared to the wider population. So why haven't we thought of how people have that end of life care? It's not health. It's psychosocial, it's protection, it's everything, it's dignity, it's picking up the phone, making sure that they can reach their family members, maybe spiritual support, maybe uh, maybe there are commodities that will help in the home or not. But I think we just have to realise that the, the, the indicator for a crisis is very much to do with elevated mortality and death. Um, so we, we all want to uh, you know, save lives, but also making sure that end of life is dignified. Uh, doesn't have to be huge interventions, is a big one. So it's the beginning of the palliative care journey. It's not a health one, it's a everyone one. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm looking forward to us getting stronger on that side. Fully agree. Um, Thank you very much. Um, and Boris, I'm going to hand over to you because oh, you've got no, three minutes well, uh, left. I just wanted to thank as well, uh, Mario, for the wonderful intervention. That was very much appreciated and definitely. Um, there are three minutes uh, before we uh, this session arrives to one end. But if there is any kind of last comment question from any of the participants. Please go ahead and.
otherwise, if uh, you agree, Eva, we will start giving an end to, to this session. And, uh, and I think that I can speak on behalf of both, uh, both of us of such a wonderful time. Uh, the, we have been working a lot uh, in, in order to, to make this year of a reality. And now when we said it with the colleagues, when we speak with you, we see that we were in the right way. For sure, there are ways, for, uh, there are aspects that will need to be improved. No, no hesitation, but there is a big step. No? And uh, that makes us uh, particularly happy. And we really appreciate your participation. Uh, I, I will just keep in, uh, I will just invite you to, to keep in mind a couple of the key messages. No? Uh, and then a, a, a small story that happened during the process of the production of the year, uh, which is, is common sense, is not rocket uh, science, and it's possible to be achieved. And it really makes uh, a difference and a, and a great impact. Um, so please make uh, take your own ownership of the of the year from now on. Make it yours in case that you need any kind of support from the cluster at country level, at global level. Don't hesitate to reach us anytime. We will keep making noise and communications and trying to 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 spread and launch the the year as much as possible in the in the coming period. So stay online as well and aware in case that you want to participate more actively in any of the activities again at country level or at global level and then a small story it happened then during the discussions eva uh, eva asked me for a very important question uh, a very important meeting because we needed to discuss something critical and when she started to explain it it was because health as she was uh, telling me in the summary of the discussion health is also is also protection how you feel with that boris and my feedback it was thank you so much eva you are the first sector that you are acknowledging that also is protection, but now I will take your word and I will invite you to convince the other sectors to do the same. No, so very much welcome, very much, <laughs> very much congratulations for having given that step, and uh, we will keep working. Uh, we will keep working together. Uh, this is a common effort. Uh, there are not uh, the, the credit goes to all the colleagues that Eva was mentioning at the beginning that they were hard, working very hard to make it happen. In to our consultant Jordan Davidov that he was managing wonderfully all the discussions, feedback different versions, etc. And now it's a reality. Let's make it happen. It has been a pleasure from my side to, to spend this time with all of you. Absolutely a wonderful session. I, I um, um, Eva, if you want some final words. Uh, just to say thank you to everyone online today. It's uh, It's been a great, great discussion. And we hope uh, keep that any feedback, please give it. We are open for it. It's not a one way thing. It's two way. And uh, we can only get stronger with your inputs. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, thank you to each of you uh, and every one of you. Have a lovely evening or afternoon and talk to you soon. Goodbye.